Yes, my name is Cliff Maurer. I am the Public Works Director for the City of Santa Barbara. We just bumped into each other on the order of a week ago, recently at the Measure C Advisory Committee meeting. Correct. Tell us about Measure C. Well, Measure C is one of the most important ballot measures that the city has passed in the last probably uh, three or so decades in that uh, the voters or residents of uh, Santa Barbara elected to tax themselves 1% sales tax. And uh, essentially the proceeds or revenues from that uh, ballot measure will go towards or have gone towards uh, the capital improvements uh, for the city of Santa Barbara. We have a lot of infrastructure and including things like roads, city facilities. Um, we have a police station that is wholly uh, inadequate for today's requirements. And through Measure C, we've, we've designed a new police station. And hopefully next year, we're gonna award a contract and start building that new police station. Uh, we've improved a lot of our uh, streets, we have a lot more to go. All the paving you see in the city, a majority of that is paid for through Measure C revenue. So one of the things you said at Measure C, before Measure C, you didn't have a lot of projects. So now that you do, this ballot measure has risen to a higher level of attention. Let's go there, Cliff. Yes. Uh, Thanks, Frank. Um, the, the city is going to take before council on, well, we've already gotten direction to bring back to council a ballot measure for the March 2024 presidential primary and change to the city's charter. And the change is pretty simple. It's just asking the, the voters, and you have to, any change to the charter has to go to the voters. And we're asking the voters to allow the city to have more options when it comes to procuring contracts in support of public works type contracts for the city. And that's pretty simple. The uh, current charter specifically requires us to use low bid contracting with the exception of a few water-related projects. And maybe when the charter was written, undoubtedly that was the best way to uh, go about contracting for uh, public works type contracts. But times have changed, procurement methods have, have changed, and we are not, we the city are no longer even in the game in that many contractors won't even put a bid together on a low bid contract because they feel that there's not enough scrutiny as to who gets to bid and who doesn't and that people put or other contractors put in bids that are ridiculously low because they don't understand the work gaming the system well it's sometimes there are some that game the system and there are others santa barbara is a great example we have many historic buildings in, in this city everybody understands that and, and loves that um, when you renovate a historic building it's not the same as doing a renovation project on a more modern building let's say one that's 30 or 40 years old uh, it costs a lot more money to do it right when you're restoring or repairing or recapitalizing a historic building. But if you do that by low bid, I guarantee you the bidder that's going to win is not going to completely understand the nuances of, of doing that type of construction. And in the end, they'll lose money and the city will get a project that does not come in anywhere close to the time it was supposed to with all kinds of change orders and a lot of staff time taken up. Uh, so if you use these alternative methods, like best value contracting, instead of just doing a straight bid, we'll do a request for proposal. Cost will be a factor in selecting the contractor, but it also will be things like experience in renovating historic buildings and experience working here in the Santa Barbara area and other, uh, you know, their, their reputation and their 
their quality on previous jobs. And all that together will help us land on a contractor, which might have a slightly higher cost at the beginning, but by the very name Best Value, I'm confident we'll have a lower price when the project is completed. So when somebody bids low, a low bid proposal, they get the job, but then things can go off the rails pretty easily. They haven't anticipated, they don't have anything in the budget in case they didn't understand the original project scope. Correct. And, and what, what I've, I've been with, I've been in this business for almost 40 years, but I've been with the city of Santa Barbara for the past two years. And what I've seen since I've been here, for the most part, are well-intentioned contractors bidding on our contracts, but not from this area. And, I, and I'm not talking all contracts, I'm mostly talking vertical construction. So that would be facilities, buildings, those type of contracts. Um, and what, what, what I've seen, again, as I said earlier, that many of the better contractors, because putting together bids costs money, and if they don't win, those are, th th those are costs they can't recover. Um, and that's, that's obviously a business loss. So if they have other alternatives where they feel their chance of capture, which is the industry term for winning a contract, are higher, that's, those are the type of contracts they're going to pursue. So who you have left are what I would say more generalist. Um, for, for your general contractors. And what I've seen since I've been here are contractors out of northern San Diego County, East LA, some North LA County. And they see a project, they, they, you know, of course they access the plans and specifications, they look through it and they say, yeah, I can do this work. I've done similar work. And they put together a bid and put it in. It's pretty low. They win the contract and then probably even before they mobilize, because as they start putting together their subcontractors and their workforce, and then talking to their material suppliers as to what it's going to cost to work specifically in Santa Barbara, they realize, wow, I blew that portion of my bid. And there's, at this point, they have a legal and binding contract, so now they're starting the job in the hole. And then it just goes downhill from there. So with, with, for this type of contracting, um, it, it would be better to use alternative methods such as best value. Now I will say for like paving contracts, that's a pretty select group of contractors. And we don't get, and they know what it takes to pave in, in, in Santa Barbara. We have about three or four paving contractors that bid on our jobs. And low bid works perfectly for that. And we'll probably continue to use low bid because best value won't add anything. When we met here at the coffee shop, you were telling me a little bit about your background before you came to Santa Barbara. Sure. I, uh, I went to the United States Naval Academy and I uh, uh, served as a civil engineer corps officer in the Navy for just about 30 years. And other, I did three operational tours with the U.S. Navy Seabees, two of which just down the coast in Port Wainimi, and one I was home ported out of Gulfport, Mississippi. All the other tours I did with the Navy were related to doing pretty much what I'm doing here as Director of Public Works, and that is uh, public works, contracts, um, environmental, real estate, um, all that utilities, all that type of work in support of the Navy and Marine Corps team. So uh, during my time, I had the opportunity to, I went to University of California, Berkeley, got my master's in civil engineering. I also had the opportunity to go to uh, Wharton School of Business to uh, get executive management. And uh, I did a lot of contracting for the Navy. And it was uh, very similar to the situation here that it started out being predominantly low bid contracting. And then we evolved, we, the federal government, Department of Defense, into using other methods. And really that's what we're asking 
um, the voters to, to give us that flexibility. So in addition to best value, also design build, and for larger projects, um, it's called construction manager at risk or CMAR. And I'll give you a quick example of where you're seeing that being done is for the 101 widening project, uh, Caltrans District 5 entered into a construction manager at risk contract with Granite Construction. And even though uh, if you travel that corridor, you're probably frustrated as a, as a driver, but I can see it through years of experience, that project is going extraordinarily well. They are staying right on schedule. Uh, you could argue you wish it would be uh, quicker. All of us do. But it's hard uh, widening a uh, freeway uh, that you have to keep open 24-7 and there's no alternative route. So I, uh, my hat's off to them. They're doing a good job. So Cliff, that four-letter expression again? CMAR. It's a yeah, construction manager at risk. What's the distinction with that approach? Well, that, that is really reserved for a large project, at least as far as Santa Barbara goes, large project. I would say 25 million or, or larger. And the, the, there's two huge advantages to using that type of construction method or contracting method. One is, is that the, the contractor gets involved in the design very early, around 25 or 30 percent design. That way, um, constructability is incorporated into the design, saves money, saves time. Um, and, and then before the design is final, usually around 90% design, the, the general contractor is then required to commit to being the general for the construction portion. And the important part is to provide a guaranteed maximum price. And from the owner side, so the, like the city, it is great to have a guaranteed maximum price because you know that you'll never pay more than that. And so that's, uh, that's the advantage. Now, uh, had we had this authority three or four years ago, the new police station project would have been a great project to use this method. It's too late now to use CMAR, but we can use best value for the, for the uh, procurement of the construction portion. There's a future project, as I think most people know, the airport is going to do some significant expansion. And uh, that might be a project that we want to think about using that strategy. So this ballot measure, the police station could be a beneficiary? Oh, absolutely. 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 Yes. Well, once city council approves the ballot measure, at that point, city staff can no longer lobby for it. We can answer factual questions, but we can't go out and, and lobby uh, the public because we have to be impartial. Once, once it's on the ballot. So um, I, I'm pretty confident that these methods are so uh, commonplace now by public agencies. They've proven themselves. As a matter of fact, not doing it hurts the city agencies as opposed to if there's any risk. So uh, I'm pretty confident as long as people understand what's in front of them, they will see this as, uh, I'll use a technical term, a no-brainer. <laughs> and the nature of making changes to the city charger, you'll be able to put it into use like in the next fiscal year, something like that? Oh, I, the way it's structured is the actual change to the charter as we're, we're going to propose to council is pretty simple. And it's just to say that to give authority through ordinance to have other competitive means of, of procuring public works contracts. That's it. That would be the charter. And that's what most charter cities have. And then... Wow, that's pretty terse. It is. It's very simple. 
And but for full visibility, so everybody understands, there's no sleight of hand here. Our, uh, between Public Works and the City Attorney's Office, we've drafted the ordinances that would would go into place to to modify our procurement methods. And they they talk they they spell out what we've been talking about. And as Council Member Jordan asked at our previous council meeting, which is really important, he said, let me be clear that if we're not binding the city into any specific procurement method that a future council can change the ordinances, and he is absolutely right. At any time, city council can say, uh, maybe we don't want to use this method anymore, and if they have four votes, they can they can change the ordinance. So, the, the, like I said, the only thing that's being, um, I, I guess, codified in the charter is to give the, the city more flexibility with the way we go about contract. There's so much progress on Measure C projects. Well, like, well, I was going to say, you can see. I mean, if you, and that's the one thing I'm scared is, so, and this isn't unique to Santa Barbara, is people have short memories. And I just hope as we move along with the pavement that, you know, for those neighborhoods, for those business districts that have gotten new pavement, they're loving life, but they're going to then start taking it for granted. You just got to remember some of your other Santa Barbara businesses and neighborhoods haven't got it yet. And we have to stay the course until we get our, uh, our infrastructure where it needs to be so it's, it's um, more affordable for us to sustain over future generations. I'm sure motorists are big beneficiaries with fewer potholes in their roads. But the bicycle tire rolls so much better on some of my favorite routes. I'm so gratified to see that. I feel like I had a personal stake in the Measure C process. Yes. Yeah, and pedestrians as well. Because when we, when we repave a road, we also upgrade the curbs. So we, we uh, make sure they're American with Disability Act accessible. They have the, the, the proper truncated domes, the proper grades. Um, we also uh, take care of the sidewalks, I mean, excuse me, the crosswalks to make sure those are all compliant. So it's more than just putting a new wearing course of asphalt down. Uh, we also look at uh, the striping and the traffic flow and make sure that that's all up to modern standards as well. So there's a lot of benefits just with beyond uh, avoiding a few potholes. Cliff, you're a bicycle person yourself. You rolled up. I saw you locking up your bike just as I approached. Let's talk a little bit about your history on a bike. Yes, I'm an avid cyclist. I, um, I've been an avid road cyclist. So uh, uh, road cycling, I've been with groups uh, most of my life. I... Uh, uh, ride with the group that uh, was up here yesterday on a Sunday. Uh, we rode up from uh, Ventura uh, up to Santa Barbara for the second weekend in a row. Uh, as you know, it, people just can't imagine. Sometimes we take for granted how great we have it here. But I, uh, whether it's riding up the coast to Santa Barbara or riding down PCH to Malibu, I often think there's a avid cyclists in Iowa who would give up a year's vacation to just one day to do the ride I do without even thinking about it. But, but uh, no, I, uh, I, I ride my bike everywhere I can within reason in the city as part of my job. And then uh, when my off hours, I, uh, I like climbing. In fact, on Friday, I uh, rode up Gibraltar, uh, one of my favorite rides ever. <laughs> Very good. So, new bicycle infrastructure coming? Yes. Yes, we, uh, 
I think most people know that the city has a, which is in public works department, a robust active transportation program. And that includes bicycling and pedestrians. Um, and we've made uh, improvements throughout the city, uh, all with the consideration that we know people still need cars. We know uh, in neighborhoods, people want to have reasonable parking so they can get their groceries in their house and get their kids home or off to school and all that. But uh, having bicycle infrastructure, making it easier for people to choose their bike, especially for short trips, two miles and under, as opposed to getting in their car, is a huge goal of the city. It's the environmental sustainability, right thing to do. It's safer, it's healthier. I mean, I could go on and on. So right now we have a project that's, that's uh, continuing on the east side over in the Coda area. We have uh, the west side Paseos project. Uh, we're gonna start a project up on the Mesa on Cliff Drive. Um, we're, we're in the process of that right now. As you know, um, uh, we're a link in the coastal bike trail and the Modoc Road um, uh, bike path is just about complete. And uh, if you haven't been on it and you have a bicycle, I recommend you get on it. Yeah, I, I, that was great. Frank, I really have you ever heard of Bob Ingalls? Bob Ingalls, he was a former congressman from South Carolina. And uh, I think I heard it on NPR or something, but he, uh, he was a Republican congressman who had pretty much just bought into the platform. And uh, his son was uh, 17 or 16, I think, when he got elected the first time. But when he was running, or maybe it was the second time, and when he was running for re-election, of course, every two years, um, he, he was a climate change denier, which was kind of the platform. And his, he, he, he was talking to his son, and his son asked him, uh, or he asked his son, he said, you're going to vote for me. And he goes, well, Dad... He goes, I want you to read this information on climate change, because I know you're a thoughtful individual. And once you read it and we talk about it, no matter what your opinion is, I will vote for you. But if you don't read it, I won't vote for you. So Ingalls read it and then he realized, he goes, you're right, I'm, I'm, I'm behind a position that's not true and I need to change that. Um, and so, although he's, he remained conservative, he changed his position on climate change, and then he got primaried, and he, he, he uh, didn't even make it out of the primaries uh, to, to um, hold his seat. And he, he kind of went on the lecture circuit, and um, his quote was, societies that don't listen to their young people get stuck, and then the world passes them by. And, and I, you know, I, I really think about that because oftentimes in very well-established communities, people who have understandably a lot of knowledge and experience think they know all the right things, and they discount what the young generation thinks and believes, and that's, they do at their own peril, because I think the young people, we were all there at one point, and sometimes, at times, unrealistic, but we're believing in, a, in an unbound future, and we should listen to them.